It's time for the Margin Matters Minute with Money Man, Jason Brown. All right, everybody, welcome back to the channel today. I'm so excited to have a special guest and we are continuing my theme on teaching kids about money. And today, Mr. Clifton Corbin is joining me and Clifton is a registered financial consultant who has spent years studying finance and is passionate advocate for advancing uh, the financial literacy of children and young adults. Uh, his mission is to give you the tools and skills you need to ensure your children the that they are financially literate and ready to manage in a world where the use of money is, is constant. And one of the, t the tools that he's given us is this fantastic new book that he has written. It's titled Your Kids, Their Money, and it's, uh, it, it's a parent's guide to raising financially literate children. Clifton, thank you so much for joining us and sharing more about your book. Thank you so much for having me on. I really appreciate it. I appreciate the series that you're doing. Obviously, if my passion is to get kids to teach, learn to learn financial literacy. You just doing this series is wonderful. So thank you for doing what you're doing. Of course, it's it's such as we both know, this is such an important topic, uh, teaching the next generation about uh, what I call the most important life survival skill is is learning about money so so let's dive right into some of the questions i had for you uh so the first one obviously is hey you know what inspired you to write this book like why was sure. this book so important to you to write sure so i <laughs> i know we just met at fincon where i saw a bunch of people you i think myself maybe yourself as well included have the you know money nerds on their t-shirt well, i like to call myself a money nerd before it was cool to put it on t-shirts so when i was a little kid like i'm talking like early you know eight seven six i was even at that age i was fascinated by money like i couldn't learn enough about money i would you know do anything i could to get money i would always be asking my parents about money um so i was kind of just fascinated by money at an early age and you know had all those early jobs the lemonade stand you know i was doing uh the paper routes so all the stuff to get money and i learned how to make money and i even learned a bit about saving money but I went off to university and like way too many young people, I got those early credit cards and I made a mess of my finances. Like I didn't know what I was doing. And I look back after I got myself back on solid ground. I was like, for someone who was so interested in money and for someone who was just like curious, like I said, I was a money nerd. I was a money geek. I couldn't learn enough about it. How did I still make a mess of my finances? And when I look back and I asked that question, I realized part of the reason was as much as I was curious about money and as much as I wanted to learn about money, I only learned about a couple aspects of money. I learned, like I said, I learned how to earn. I was pretty good at saving, but I never really learned about debt and what it was for. I didn't learn about insurance or taxation or, or any other components of financial literacy. And my goal with this book and with what I'm doing is to make sure that young people get that information before they need it. So once they're off on their own and they're, you know, they're, they're in the world, they're in the wild and they're managing their money. I want them to feel comfortable. I want them to feel confident and I want them to understand what they're doing with their money. And the only way for that to happen is if they get that information while they're young before they need it. So that was the, that was the reasoning behind the book is to give parents tools, resources, tips, suggestions, language, so that they can teach their kids all the aspects of financial literacy. That's awesome, man. It's so good to hear. And it's, uh, you know, there's such a, it seems like there's a movement now of, of with people like yourself writing books, giving resources to parents uh, to teach kids. And it's so refreshing to see. Now, I do want to ask you this. So you you have some kids, right? Of your own? I do. I do. Yeah. How old are your kids? So my oldest is 10 and my youngest is eight. Okay. So would, would it be safe to say that you wrote this book for them or did you write this book for your younger self or maybe both? It's, it's both. It's, it's both and um i i wrote it for my younger self it's all the things i wish i knew when i was younger but i feel like my kids are probably in a pretty good situation in that i'm still a money nerd and i'm still eager to talk about it and i'm still talking about it so we have these conversations on a regular basis so i really wrote it for anyone who is a parent who is uh, maybe unsure of what to say or what they need to teach, or for the parents who maybe heard those messages when they're younger, like, you know, we don't talk about money or mm -hmm. money's just an evil thing and you don't need to worry about money or, you know, this is our thing, you don't need to worry about that. For any of the parents who need more information and for 
for all of the kids out there who are going to someday be, you know, adults and need to manage their money. I wrote this for them, uh, more, much more so than my kids. But I did want to obviously give my kids, you know, a, a sample of how I'm trying to give this information to other people. So it's for everyone. But it, like I said, my kids are probably, I'm hoping, will be okay because this is this is something that happens around our dinner table right. on the regular. So yeah. That's awesome, man. That's so great to hear. Um, so the next question, this is kind of a big one, man. Uh, you know, we're, we're going to bust open the, the bottle, if you will, whatever you want to call it. Just, so so you're, let, we're going to let the viewers know, you're in Toronto, Canada, correct? That's right. That's okay, right. so I'm in Atlanta, Georgia, USA. So this is going to be an interesting conversation because we're in two different countries. So the, the, the question is, you know, here in America, it seems like uh, it's, finance and money is not taught in the majority of schools in our country. And I think that's similar to Canada. And I'll let you chime in on that in just a second. But so here in America, you know, we, there's only 14 state last checked, there was only 14 states. Uh, and I think there's 50 uh, that that require that actually have a mandated like course requirement, a financial literacy course requirement for uh, high school kids to graduate. And th there's been a little bit of a recent movement. I know Florida recently, their governor DeSantis, he recently signed a mandate or whatever, a law or whatever it's called. Uh, and then of course, Georgia, I'm in Georgia, of course, Georgia does whatever Florida does. So then they followed uh, Florida. And then I think Michigan was the recently the most recent state, I think they were the 14th state. I think you're uh, right. It, it, so now there's about 14 states that actually have a requirement. Now, it's, it's not much of a requirement, I'll be honest, they have to take like, it's like half it's a one high credit. school. Yeah, yeah it's like a, it's probably like an elective, like one elective class and you get like half a credit or something. But hey, it's a start, right? You know, it's a start. So what what are things like in Canada with with, you know, uh, teaching money in schools? Sure. So we're we might be a little further ahead, but we've got a smaller population. So that kind of helps. It's being required in some school districts in some provinces so our provinces are similar to your states so some of the provinces have picked it up so the province i'm in in ontario it has now become part of the curriculum and it's, it's actually quite good in that it's part of the curriculum not just at the high school level but also in the elementary school level um my challenge with the the way it's being done in schools is that kind of like what you said it's not uniform right so we don't really know what like it's up to the different school uh, boards the different areas to kind of determine how they want to do it and I don't think it's adequate. So even for yourself in the States, then you you might've noticed this, I wrote this in my book, like even for the areas that it is required, the students who receive that education, I, I'm using some quotes around the word education there, they come out of those programs, they go into uh, into college and they say they, they don't feel confident managing their money, even when they had to take the course and even when it was required for them to graduate from, from high school, they still don't feel like they have adequate information to manage the money or to be confident in managing their money. So both in Canada and in the United States, <clears throat> pardon me, both in, in both countries, it's starting, it's coming into the school system, but it's still not enough. Like we're still only getting the 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 tip of the iceberg, if you will, as far as how much information needs to get across. So the other challenge here too, and I, I talk about this again in my book, is that, you know, it, we're talking about personal finance and that word personal is very, very prominent. And when we talk about personal finance, right? So if we're in a classroom setting and we start talking about, you know, let's say giving money away or managing a budget or what have you, there's going to be a lot of um, variance in that classroom between the, some kids might have a lot, some kids might not. And it takes a lot of nuance to have those conversations in a group setting, which is another reason why I'm really encouraging parents to take this up because you know your financial situation, you know your values around money, you know your kids best. So you are the best person to educate your child on these matters until the school system kind of picks it up. And even after they pick it up even to a higher degree, I still think parents are going to have a massive role to play when it comes to educating their kids with regards to financial literacy, just because, again, they have more information and they can get to the nuances that I don't think a group setting in a classroom will be able to get to, at least not in the near term. Yeah, that's uh, that's very well said. And, and I think you kind of answered my, my follow-up question was with a lot of what you just said, but what do you have any thoughts on why it's not taught in the school systems? Like, what is it just, you know, lack of education by the teachers or is it just, like you said, it, it's such a taboo topic too. You mentioned yeah, that. I, 
I don't what, think what it's do the think? lack of education on the teacher's parts. So like I know teachers and I know business teachers and I actually had a business teacher who consulted with me on this book. So, you know, I'm, it's not that they don't have the content. It's, there's a few reasons, right? Like there's a lot of content that schools are trying to give to children. And then you're trying to add this in. It, it there's sometimes it's not enough time. Sometimes it's not enough resources. Maybe it's sometimes the teachers aren't don't have the the skill set. But I think it's more uh, the core of it is more that you know the school setting has never really been about teaching life skills. Like it's never been the source of life skills when it comes to uh, like we used to have you know home economics and right, that was right. You know that was that was close. That was something. Mm -hmm. And it, you know we had some budgeting in there and we had you know other life skills in there. I remember taking home ec when I was in in uh, high school and right. learning how to like bake learn, all learn, these yeah, things learn, that learn were life skills. But that was one course out of the whole like it was never like the school system at least from what I've seen, and I'm not a teacher, I'm not an educator in that regard, but the school system from what I've seen has never been the the mechanism to teach our, our population life skills. Unfortunately, because we feel like it should be, it is the perfect setting. You've got a group of you know willing students who are trying to learn how to manage in the real world, um, but we're giving them you know different pieces of education that they may or may never use once they enter into the workforce like it, it's it's a challenge that I think we just I think it's a bigger challenge where we just need to rethink what we're giving students within the school setting and I can I can go on this one for a little bit because if you think about it like what you teach now especially with technology uh robotics artificial intelligence like if we're teaching kids certain skills now we need to be able to teach them how to adapt and adopt what they learn to live in the world that they're going to live in, teaching them the things that they, they're seeing now, you know, most of it's going to be obsolete in two, three, four years anyway. So we really need to be teaching our kids, one, those life skills and, you know, managing money is one skill that hasn't changed really in hundreds of years. So much so that, you know, I think I mentioned to you, one of my favorite books is The Richest Man in Babylon. I just wrote a, I just did an updated version of it. That book was written in 1926. And I think it still has as much value now as it did when it was written. So, you know, the skills that they, the kids need to learn, those don't necessarily, those money skills don't change. But some of the other things that they may be learning in the school system, it's dated. And we need to, as a society, need to rethink how we're, what we're teaching in the school setting. That that's so well said, man. And and when you were just saying dated, I was thinking of the word antiquated. Just like you know, that a lot too. of things it just need to be, you know, updated or or refreshed or refined. Uh yeah, that's there's there's so many reasons why uh money isn't taught to school. You know, to me, you know, like we talked about, you know, the high school requirement. And you know, when I saw that, I was like, no, they need to be teaching this at, at kindergarten. Like they, that's they, the other they, thing. You're right. At, at five years old, kids need to be learning how to count coins or count money and and, and stuff like that. It, it identify currencies, you know, all kind of stuff like that. That's what I'm doing with my kids on my own. I have a six year old and a two year old son, and that's what I do with them. But but uh, hey, you know, you got to crawl before you can walk, I guess, right? So I agree with you. I agree so, with you. And to to your point yeah. about teaching the little ones, like one of the things that I did, and I don't know if you saw it on my website, but I created a workbook specifically for the little ones. So you have the, you know, counting coins and, you know, identifying money and identifying bills and doing some of that early work, because you're right, if we just do it at high school, it's, it's almost too late. It's right. never too late, but it's almost too late because like, I remember for myself, like I mentioned to you, like I got into debt problems when I got off into university, mm -hmm. I was 18 years old. The first time I ever had a bill that I had to repay, I was 18 years old. It was the first time I ever had to deal with it. We need to start introducing these topics way earlier. And right. you're right, at five years old, kids can get it. Kids can get That's it. That's right. That's right. So true. Uh, so we're talking with uh, Mr. Clifton Corbin, who is the author of Your Kids, Their Money. Uh, now, Clifton, out of this entire book, which is a tremendous resource, of course. What would you say are are maybe some of the uh, most important topics or aspects that that you covered in the book? And I know that might be hard to narrow it down. That is, that is super two. hard to narrow down. But I'm going to refine my entire book, which is you know it's my magnum opus here. So you're asking a lot. But anyway, I'm going to refine <laughs> it down to one thing. Okay. And I I actually just I think I just said it. We need to give our children chances to learn this material and experience this material at a much earlier age. So if there's one takeaway from my book, it is 
find opportunities to let your children practice m good money habits uh, at an early age. So mm -hmm. if you have it within your budget to give an allowance, and in my book, I give, you know, a bunch of to do's uh, and how to get an allowance practice started. But if you have the money in your budget to give your child an allowance, an allowance gives your child a chance to practice some of those those money habits, right? Like saving, mm -hmm. delayed gratification, even transacting. Uh, so there's a bunch of things they can practice there. If you don't have the money in your budget for an allowance, there's other ways to find um, money <clears throat> just in general to let your child practice managing money. One of the things I suggest if, you, if you're not going to give an allowance is to use some of your, let's say grocery money and let your child manage some of your grocery money. So let's say, um, I use uh, breakfast for an example. Let's say you go to the grocery store and you say to your, your child, you're going to manage breakfast for the next seven days. So here is how much we're planning to spend on breakfast, whatever that number is. You need to figure out what we're going to purchase for breakfast, whether that be a box of cereal, the milk, the eggs, whatever it is. And then they're managing it. And then if you can do it, let them make that as a separate transaction. So transaction. So they're actually transacting. So if you don't have the money for the allowance and you can let them do their own purchasing and, and uh, on their own, do it with other ways. There's other ways to do it. But the the core of what I'm trying to say is, and it's not just spending. There's the donating. There's managing a budget. There's all these other pieces. But give your children chances to practice those skills before they need it. So that's that's the big takeaway. And like I said, there's a number of ways you can do it. There's, you know, there's the allowance, but I even talk about like lending money to your kids. Like I mentioned a moment ago, I never repaid anything before I became an adult. So we can introduce those concepts earlier. There's no reason why we have to wait till our children are in their late teens to even introduce these concepts. So there's ways to do it and there's ways to do it at age appropriate ways so that your kids are they're getting this information, they're experiencing these topics, they're experiencing managing money. So we want them to say, oh yeah, I've done this before. I know what I'm doing once they get out of the home and once they're on their own. That's great. Uh, so much wisdom and all that, man. I, I really, really love it. Uh, and it's it's all practical application, like all those examples, it's, it's just perfect. Now I actually, there was one, I, I wanna share this with you. There's one, element in this book that really, really struck a chord with me. And I want to, I'm going to read it to you. It's uh, chapter 24. If anyone has the book and they want to follow along page 157, chapter 24, uh, it says the title of the chapter is priorities. We can't afford it. And you write, have you ever told your kids we can't afford it when asked to buy something, when they asked to buy something for themselves? I have, well, that is to say, I used to. So uh, before I let you uh, chime in on this, so this is the, I started th thinking about this and I was like, this is so true. My kids, you know, you can't take them to any store. You know, they go crazy. They want to buy everything. And your knee jerk reaction is always, hey, you know, we can't afford that. Well, of course I can afford to buy him a $1 Hot Wheel. I just mm -hmm. don't want to buy it because he already has 300 of them. Right. <laughs> so I'm like, so he, and kind of what you're talking about is like, that's not the right thing to say. So, so share more about this. This is really kind of a cool, like maybe change of mindset on how you, um, I guess, have conversations with your kids about money. So share more about that. I really loved what you said in that chapter. I love, I love how you said it's a change of mindset because that's exactly what I was hoping I'd get across. And the, the, the concept and the reason I put that in there uh, is because I really, we have so many opportunities as young people to, make mistakes with regards to how we think about money. You know, we we talk about how we want our young people to have a growth mindset, not a scarcity mindset. We want them to have a healthy relationship with money. If you tell your child that you can't afford something, when in reality you can, the messaging is wrong, right? You're not being intentional with what you're saying. What you're saying is one thing, but what you mean is something different. And then you leave it up to your child to interpret what's happening. And that just leaves room for error, right? So some of the examples I think I give in that, in that chapter is like, it could make your child feel like, well, if you don't have money for this, but you have money for yourself, is, are you saying you don't have money for me? And that's not the messaging we want to give our children at all, right? Like that's, that's, totally, that's totally incorrect. So what I'm asking is for parents to be very intentional with what they say when they're talking about money with their children. And now I'm not saying like we can't just, you know, say what we want to say, but you need to realize when we say what we say to our children, they are hearing it and they might not be hearing it the way that you want them to hear it. So for that one specifically, mm -hmm. I was saying, you know, 
when I'm talking to my children, this just came up a couple of days ago with my son. I try to reframe it to say, listen, I have amount of money budgeted for X, Y, and Z. That's not in our budget or that's not in our budget right now. Or, mm -hmm. you know, that's something that is in, a, in, a, in my budget for you when, you know, it's your birthday or Christmas or back to school or maybe later this year. And then I try to follow up to let them know when or how it could be acquired if it's something that they really want. But it's really trying to make sure that they understand that I'm not saying like there's no money because I don't want them to think that we're struggling. If we're not, I want them to really understand. Yes, we have money. Yes, there's actually money in the bank right now. Yes, I can buy that technically. Mm -hmm. But no, I am not going to buy that because we are prioritizing our money this way so that we can go on that family vacation so that we can pay, you know, our cell bill and our electricity bill. And I want them to understand how I'm using my money better. So again, they have a better sense of what's happening. Because really, I talk about it with the money that we uh, we use to pay our bills, the wealth that we try to create. It's all kind of behind a veil unless you open up and let your children see what's happening. And unless you do that, they won't know. And if they don't know, then they're guessing. And if they're guessing, they might be guessing incorrectly. So I'm really trying to open up, have some transparency and have some intentionality with what we say when we speak to our children about money. Yeah, that was so, that was such a convicting chapter for me because, because <laughs> I read it and I was like, yeah, like I'm, that's just not the right thing to say. Cause kids are smart. Like you just said, kids are a lot smarter than you think. And you tell them, Hey, we can't afford that, you know, right now they know that you can't afford it because, Hey, you just bought, you know, whatever that, that was all this other stuff that costs way more than this $1 hot wheel or whatever it is, or this $5 toy. So that's, that's such a good, uh, I really, that was my favorite chapter in the book. So obviously, so, um, that's a really, really good uh, thing to, to think about. So last question, um, and you, 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 you already hit, you already gave a lot of advice on this, but, but more specifically, the, the question is, what advice can you give adults, since we can't rely on schools right now, what advice can we give adults to teach uh, their kids, or even if, if they're not your own kids, any children in your life, nieces, nephews, friends, neighbors, you know, people from church, you know, if you have kids in your life, and you want to teach them these principles, you know, what, what's like the best way to get started? Like for me, I'll just share real quick. You know, I've got a six and a two year old and, and probably one of the first things we did was the money jars, like the oh, yeah. give, save, spend. So each one of my kids, uh, my actually my youngest just turned three and for his birthday, he want, he actually asked for, he wanted his own set of money jars, which we were really, really surprised and proud. But of course he wants to everything that big brother has. So, so, but he, we just got him his own set of money jars. So that's one of the first things we've done, but what, what would you say like, like at an early age, like what's the best age to maybe start? And then what are some of the first things that, that adults can do to help kids? Sure. So with regards to when to start, I like to use the kid, <clears throat> pardon me, but use the child as the barometer of when we should start. And I like to say, as soon as your child or the children in your life is recognizing that money is something that's being used to you know, trade for other items. Uh, as soon as they start asking questions or even, you know, they give you a little look when you're tapping your card to pay, that's the, that's the moment. And if they don't ever show any interest, then if you have to have an age, you know, between four, five, six, kids usually start becoming aware. So I love around that age. And some of those early lessons, like you said before, it's really money recognition. Uh, one of the things I love doing with that age is role playing. Like I love doing the, uh, you know, pretend grocery store or pretend restaurant, having them set up their rooms in those different, uh, in those different environments. And then we can walk through what it's like to actually be in one of those stores. And it's, it's a fun way just to, to, to pretend that we're, you know, we're adults and we're interacting. And I, some of my fondest memories of my kids is when we were doing like the, the pretend grocery store is great. Um, with regards to what we can do and just, you know, uh, a simple thing that all of us can do. It's just use those moments that occur naturally in your day. You know, you're in the grocery store, you're buying something, talk about how much it costs, talk about inflation, talk about how you're budgeting, talk about how you're making money, talk about how you're spending your money. It's really just naturalizing and making it comfortable to have dialogues around money as much as possible and as easy as possible. So again, using those moments that occur naturally in your day, you're walking down the street, you see something, talk about it. Don't shy away from money conversations. I think it is kind of what our society is, has, has done to us is to say, you know, we don't talk about money. 
I think for our kids' sake, we really need to reverse that and just start talking about money and make it part of your everyday. Don't make it something separate. Don't make it a complicated uh, a complicated subject. Just use your everyday natural occurrences that come up to start talking about money. And I think that will have huge impacts. And this can happen for any children in your life. And that's one thing you could do that's really, really easy. Um, that doesn't require any extra materials or any extra expenses. It's just telling stories about what's happening in your life and using the everyday to, to help you know, inform and educate the children in your life. Awesome, man. And thank you so much. I want to thank uh, Mr. Clifton Corbin once again for sharing uh, more about his great new book, Your Kids, Their Money. Now, Clifton, before we leave, let everybody know uh, if they want to connect with you or, or, or want to buy your book. Uh, you know, you have a website. What, what's the best way for people to, to reach out to you or connect to you? Sure. So the easiest way to find me is always my website, Clifton Corbin. Uh, dot com. That's got my website. It's got uh, that workbook I mentioned for kids. It's a free download. You just go on to, I think it's cliffincorbin.com slash workbook, and you can download that um, that workbook and it's free. It's got all the money um, uh, money games and, uh, and puzzles in there. Uh, another resource on my website, cliftoncorbin.com slash books is a list of great books storybooks that you can read to your kids that introduce some of these money concepts um but if you're trying to find me uh yeah go to my website if you're looking for the book it's available on audible it's available on uh amazon it's pretty much anywhere books can be found um so you can find it on any of those places again the book's called clifton uh your kids their money and again my website the easiest place to find me cliftoncorbin.com and if you have any questions about anything that you just heard uh me and jason discuss you can email me at hello at cliftoncorbin.com or you can find me on linkedin i'm in most of the places um i think on linkedin it's linkedin slash cd corbin uh and you can find me there Awesome. But thank you so much. This was such a great conversation. And I do want to uh, personally thank you for everything that you're doing uh, to, to educate, you know, the kids, the, uh, the next generation, uh, to put them in a better financial position that, that perhaps uh, our generation uh, was unable to do. So I really do appreciate it, all your efforts. Uh, once again, check out this book if you haven't. It's truly a tremendous resource. Uh, it will help you. You will learn. Adults will learn plenty from this book. It's not, you know, just kids. There's plenty to be learned from this book. Once again, thank you so much, Clifton, uh, for, for your time today. And this is Jason Brown saying thank you so much for watching. I hope you learned something. And remember my favorite saying, it's not the amount of money you make, but the margin that matters the most. See you next time. <laughs>